Hello and welcome back. We now continue with this morning session. It's the last session of the morning here in Madrid platform. I'm talking about the auditorium sessions. And as you know, every two hours we nebulize the room to um, comply with the COVID protocol measures. So we need to step out while our colleagues disinfect and execute all the prevention measures. We will now continue with the plan with the Forum for Global Citizenship. And I really, I really want to listen to Fernando Santos. I'm really looking forward to listening to him because he's going to make a presentation, a, a lecture about a figure that is very interesting, that is the senior ombudsperson. And I please uh, would like him to please step into the stage. He's a public prosecutor of the Provincial Court of Cor Cordoba. He's coordinator of the section for the protection of people with disabilities and coordinator of the Andalusian Forum for Mental Wellbeing. As, as, as I say, he's going to talk about the senior's ombudsperson. Please welcome him with a round of applause. Well, thank you all, and thank you for this wonderful introduction, a warm expression of gratitude to all of those who are here and to those who are following us online, and particularly to all the people in Latin America, my dear people from Latin America who are just waking up right now. They are waking up in the dawn. They're dawning, as one would say in Spanish. And for some time, our role at the public prosecutor office is also that of the of a, a person that defends, a person that protects the rights of seniors. Life is as it is, an imperfect garden. Since the world started, we've been struggling with opposite ideas, health, disease, darkness, lightness. Some people have decided to live life in the core, some in the margins. So those who live in the margins are people who have been isolated, who have been left aside. And today I want to talk about people, people whom we think about when thinking about our life as adults, because no one is free from adversity uh, throughout life. There's a proverb that, that says no one can pretend that throughout every day of their life the sun will shine. But in the end, in the last days of our lives, there is a moment that is kind of more complicated. And so today I want to focus on this specific time of life because we need to talk about seniors. If I raise the question, how have the different civilizations dealt with this phase of life? Well, I would say that some people have even shown veneration for this moment of life. If we read the, if we read the Bible, say, son, take care of your father, don't give him any sadness. If I came to lose my mind, something that happened, if, if you came to lose, if, if this person came to lose his mind, don't blame that on him. This is a tradition that we find in many segments and in many civilizations, this respect for, for the elderly. And this was the case up until recently. The historic model on senior care is intimate. It's, it takes place within the family life. It is the result 
of the traditions. And if there's no family, then we have the charity, but also from an intimate perspective, private perspective. There wasn't a public involvement up until recent times when the public sector started to care for the vulnerables and for everyone, including the elderly and including those who suffer from uh, any diseases or people with disabilities. When we talk about dignity or people with disabilities, we see illustrated um, fund, uh, in the ideas on education. It was thought that they could be educated. The truth is, in the end, equality, fraternity, and freedom, the, the motto of the French Revolution, changed things and encouraged this uh, care for those who needed it the most. When we talk about vulnerable people and senior citizens who sometimes suffer from uh, dementia or degenerative diseases, when these people don't have the capacity to decide, the state comes in to somehow fulfill this lack of uh, capacity to decide. This is something that needed to be solved because this entailed many, many other issues. But now, in any case, we see that the state participates and intervenes in the vulnerability of senior citizens. And within this illustrated scheme that to con that uh, control this absolute power um, created three powers, it is first the judicial uh, power where care to the elderly is um, based on. Yes, judges decide whether they want to take care of the elderly, but there are some uh, contradictions. And these contradictions is you cannot be you, you cannot judge and you cannot decide. So you cannot take part in that decision. Therefore, the state divides into two uh, courts, a court that protects and a court that decides. So the public uh, prosecutor's office and the courts. Now we are focusing on the heart of the public prosecutor's office. A vulnerable person requires the urgent attention of the public prosecutors. It is true, though, that the drift in many countries has been uh, quite different in the British systems focus was point on pun of penalty and punishment. If there is a criminal action, it is because we are representing a vulnerable person, the diffuse and specific vulnerability of the person. These two vulnerabilities justify the presence of the public prosecutor if this person is in danger. In the Mediterranean world and in Spain, we have a more humanist approach. We should remember Ms. Concepcion Arenal, hate the crime and be merciful on the criminal. This attitude will be instilled in the 19th and 20th century and will be part of the philosophy and the ideas of, of uh, legal uh, decisors in Spain. I've been in Uruguay in 2004, in Argentina in the year 2011. I participated in, at the Recampi, that's a movement for the education of the public prosecution office and there was and I must say this proudly 
Perhaps I saw this even much more in Latin America than in Spain. There was this cooperation. That is why I feel so close to my Latin America colleagues who I follow uh, closely and, where, and that place where we see lawyers and counselors who also share this humanist approach to come close to those who are, who are vulnerable, not just from a formal perspective, but also from the heart. If I talk about the um, public prosecutor's office in Spain, which is, of course, in, in, uh, which also uh, includes this thought about not being the one who decides and the one who judges, I must say that I see in the public prosecutor's office three faces in the 20, 19th century with pub, related to public order. And this, this uh, phase was still present in the, in the 1978 Constitution. And with the new Constitution, things changed. And yes, we do public order, fundamental rights. We've included more areas. And there's another phase that has to do with more abstract uh, interests that have to do with third or fourth generation. I must also say that everything I'm saying, everything I say, I write. I have a blog with 151 publications or 155, and I can't remember it very clearly. So if you want to learn more about my work, it's very easy. You can type Fernando Santos Urdaneja dot blog, Fernando Santos Urdaneja dot blog, and the history of the public prosecutor's office, about uh, the ideas about protection. All of these ideas are contained in the publication 151. So I was saying the first phase had to do with the principle of security, more formal approach, if one needs to replace or take the role of an institution, but not just to feel the triangle, the civil and, um, and, P, um, and criminal portion. And there's a paragraph from the public prosecutor's office that is 140 years old, May 8th, from 1889, at the same time the civil code uh, was drafted, and it says, the intervention of the public prosecutor is not just a formality, it always represents a guarantee of a right, whether it is established right that has a public interest or a private uh, in, uh, or a private effect on a person, and therefore the public prosecutor's office would not comply or meet its mission if within the scope of its application and in line with the law, it didn't provide in each specific case support to the person that requires such aid. So here we see that behind each number and each name, there's a heart. So the second phase of the Spanish Public Prosecutor's Office in Article 124 of the Constitution, has a three-sided uh, approach, public interest, social interest, and the safeguard of, of fundamental rights of all citizens, and in particular, particularly of the most vulnerable. Today, we are going to talk about the fundamental rights or the protection of this plural complex group that is the senior citizens who care for 
for the interest and protect the interests is the goal. But if one wants to protect something, we need to know what it is and how we are going to do it. And I will talk about this in the next few minutes. How can we get to know the reality of senior citizens? Well, I think we need to take the context into consideration, also the group and its plurality, its plural character. And we need to wonder, people who are now 70, 80 years old, how was the world when they were born in the year 1930s, 1940s or 50? How was the world back then? It was very, very different. Really, really different. When they were 15 or 20 years old, they wouldn't have thought that when they turned 80 or 85 or 90, the things that we are now seeing would happen. But that's the way it's been. That world that they knew that live between wars and the world uh, wars and and the postmodernist era, and now we are amidst transhumanism. And going back to the idea of postmodernity, which is the environment in which we need to interpret or, or see how we're going to protect the rights, postmodernity is the result of four revolutions, the demographic revolutions, thinking that between the year nine, uh, that in the beginning of the 20th century and the 21st uh, century, we have triple life expectancy. Back then, you would die at 35 or 40 years old. Now, in the 2000s, this figure has doubled or tripled. And this raises important challenges. There is a legal revolution that has to do with the progress of law and of the rights that define themselves as social states. There's a technological revolution and a social revolution, which is strongly related to the women's revolution who traditionally were left at home and now but now this this fight has uh, been um, taken an important role in the social arena in the public arena birth rates have also decreased since and the idea of okay, having parents but no children, all of these strains are present. And in the, in the technological area, there are um, elements that have helped us. There are resources that can help us extend the physical life, not so much mental life. There are no good news in this area. Neurologists tell me I am part of the Spanish uh, Association of Neuropsychiatry. Say, don't fool yourself. There's no, there's no much more progress on neurons since Ramon and Cajal in 1906. The truth is that we do have a series of, of devices or elements such as teleworking. All of this is postmodernity, postmodernism. But also, we have this environmental strain, this geopolitical conflict as well, uh, the, the West, the East, civilizations, the new nationalisms that are also creating tension that are stemming all over the world, educational tension, family tensions, all of this makes me think that the world is about to to implode. And finally, I won't talk much about transhumanism that bases everything on AI and wherever the man cannot go, a machine will, and this great ethical conflict and brings us uh, phenomena as the neuro rights. And I'm talking about this because all of this affects senior citizens. And I would also like to mention a shortcoming in terms of leader, leadership, both in the political and the religious arena. It's not like they don't exist, but they're not as strong 
to bear the burden. There is a certain political crisis, also a crisis of values. If we go back to the 18th century, to the illustration period, some people have said the 19th century was a century of freedom, the 20th century was a century of equality, and the 21st century of fraternity. But it looks like it's not the case, that we're not headed towards that road. So this is uh, a bit uh, the, the overview of the situation we are in. And the repercussions for seniors is uh, for seniors are huge. Say that happiness includes a good dose of health, money, and love. And there are some citizens that are lucky enough to have all three of them, but some others don't have any, and there are some people in the middle. So all of this creates several situations, and it's not the same to be 65 than being 75 or 80. It's not the same to live by yourself than to live with your family or at an elderly home. It's not the same to live in, the, in a rural environment or in the cities. In the end, there are so many situations and circumstances amongst uh, senior citizens who all share this world of uh, postmodernism that we need to think a lot to, to provide a, an accurate solution. Because if, if we don't take everyone into consideration, it won't work. If we don't carry out a microanalysis, things won't work. How do we do this? How do we go about this? How should this ombudsperson embrace this mission to protect? We, also, we only have a, a weapon, and that's the law. The rest, the rest is volunt volunt volunteerism. The added value that public prosecutor's office can give is interpret or provide legal pretensions that lead to legal decisions. We, we don't have any other means. So the question is, do we have it? Do we have that? Do, do we have a right to aging? Do we have a right to being old, to being a senior? Well, it depends. It depends on the following. I have already said that uh, the sphere of the elderly was that of morality, the home, customs, and traditions, and ethics. And that's all there is. Until in the last quarter of the 20th century, someone realized that, uh, well, their respect and narration was uh, decreasing. I work a lot with people with disabilities and with mental illnesses, and I see how they've been gaining in dignity and their risk situation has been improving. And then this other one that was up in, in the spheres of respect and veneration has been dropping to situations of risk. Let's look at the UN. In 1982, the General or the World Assembly, there was a World Assembly at the United Nations about aging. And then there was a resolution in favor of elderly people. Then there was a, an agreement about uh, aging people. It is true that Ibero-American is doing better. I think in things that uh, have to do with, with persons have advanced more. There is a charter of 2012 for the elderly. This charter was done in San Jose in Costa Rica. And then there is the, the Inter-American Declaration of Human Rights of Elderly People of June 2015. And this is an important text. Ibero-American uh, jurists are integrating it very quickly into their practice, and we, we're, we're taking longer. 
This is a text, an admirable text that we don't have. In Europe, we don't have anything similar at a regional level. In Spain, at a state level, we have a few fragmented texts. Some communities might have some laws. And then um, the criminal code lacks completely a, a special corpus to protect the elderly. Uh, protect them against uh, racketeering or whatever because they are treated as if they were 35 years old and two masters in economics. I think this should be corrected. And then the, the United Nations Convention of the Elderly that is so awaited still doesn't exist. Nonetheless, since 2006, we have the Convention for Persons with Disabilities from December of 2006. Some parallel works were done for the elderly, but it never bore any fruit. And we need that so that then we can um, build on that at, an in, at a national level. So that is the background. And uh, what do we as public prosecutors can do? Well, my experience is about uh, promoting some things and fighting against others. I promote what I consider to be the priority, which is to have the opportunity for happiness. There are eight constitutions in the world that talk about happiness. And I think everything really uh, circles around that, to have the opportunity to be happy with natural limits of not um, damaging and harming others or breaking the law. Then to promote self-sufficiency, which is uh, that along with autonomy, our words associated with with, um, with dignity. Then quality of life if they are in, in care homes and to fight against ill treatment. So I will explain to you what my function is. I spoke about promoting and safeguarding the right to have the opportunity to be happy. And for that, we simply have to ask someone, Mrs. Mr., what makes you happy? Because sometimes we take things for granted, and we think we know everything, but whatever you think when you're 35, when you're a public prosecutor and you're 35 years old, you might think that what makes the elderly sitting in front of you happy are certain things that they actually don't care about. But this is a, an easy, a problem that it's easy to solve. You just have to ask. One of the texts I like to refer to was uh, written more than 100 years old by Ortega and Gasset, and it was uh, Ortega and Gasset, and it was a reflection of uh, El Quixot. These clouds that uh, roll in at the end of life, and the and how insignificant our our options of happiness might be for others. So, reflections from the Quixot. When we have reached pessimism, when we can't find anything in the universe that seems like an affirmation capable of saving us, we look into the small things of day-to-day -day life. And that's when we realize that it's not great things, great pleasures, or great ambitions that keep us on this side of life, but that minute of well-being sitting next to the chimney during the winter or the nice feeling of having a glass of spirits or the way a young woman walks although we don't know her or love her or a gentle voice that speaks to us there is a secret of vitality that contemporary humans should understand and reflect on. I think that says it really well. And these uh, verses of Manuel Alcantara also express it in the similar way. He's talking about an elderly person. He liked few things, alcohol and windows, looking at the ocean from, from a hill, the, mar the, the ocean in the beach the smell of jasmines, morning books, the smell of recently baked bread, 
the writings of Quevedo and the summer, the friends, these are fundamental rights. And you learn about this when you ask them. Because at the end of your life, fundamental rights become less and options fewer. The second one of my endeavors is to avoid ill treatment. What I'm going to tell you might sound strange to you. But imagine we have three categories. In the fourth floor of a building, you have um, a couple, a marriage that lives with, with, uh, with the, bless, the triple blessing of health, love, and money. Then on the third floor, who have less, and then on the, on the second floor, that has even less. My experience says that ill treatment happens in the three apartments. One might think that the couple that has the blessing of health and money may be happy, but they, they, they might have what we call as the slave grandparent. And I'm going to explain it. This doesn't mean that grandparents should not take care of their grandchildren. I think that taking care of your grandparents up to 30% of your time is good. And more than that, I think is slavery. And grandparents will never complain to their children about that. They will do it, but then they will go and talk to their friends and say, I can't bear it anymore. And they will say, what I did when I was 70 years old with my first grandchildren, now I have to do it with the second one in my 80s, and I can't take it any longer. I don't know, maybe we should think about having a, a, a pact or, or an agreement on how our relationship with our grandchildren is going to be like, how much are we going to look after them. I, I talked about this in Cordoba once, and the grandparents, when they saw me in the street, they applauded. Because, you know, there, there is a lot to be said about that. Then there is economic abuse. Particularly from, from the outside, from what is not from the family. There was um, a scam of, of shares, of preferred shares that uh, depleted the savings of many, many elderly people. I will not delve deeper into that, but I just um, want to put on the table that there are many, many ways of ill treatment. There is not only physical abuse, but uh, there is other type there are other types of more immaterial abuse that can nonetheless harm very deeply. So we must uh, promote self-sufficiency, particularly in Spain. In the Anglo-Saxon world, this had already been developed. Um, nowadays, Mm, writing your will has uh, become somewhat natural. Although we don't like to think about it, we have to consider that in the, in the last years of our lives, maybe not when we're 60 or 65, but later, we might lose our capacity, our possibility to decide. But while we can still decide, we should go to the notary and do what is called prevented proxy, saying who we want to be a representative, who we want as proxy. Many say, under any circumstances, would I want this person to to be my proxy? They, and sometimes say, they come to me and they tell me, I am going to make uh, powers by proxy, but I don't want this person under any circumstance because I know they will want to harm me. And then I ask them, well, then who do you want? Now, um, we have uh, friendship and family, and sometimes I can see that by experience, the representative powers by proxy are not given to a relative but to a friend because there is a greater amount of trust. And I think this has to do with the rupture of the, of the pact of uh, you take care of us when we're little and we will take care of you when you're 
old. Th that was broken a long time ago. I asked that to my to my son once. To my, and when I asked him, are you going to take me to, to a care home? And he told me, of course, yes. And then the, the youngest, the girl said, yeah, probably so. So I said, I take good note. Then the other guarantor started, that was a state, started saying, well, I, I don't know if I'll be able to pay your pension, maybe the minimum decent amount. And they never told us how much, how much that was, which means we are left adrift and we're going to figure it out. This gave birth to the reform of the Criminal Code of the year 2013. This is the document that is taught. This, uh, this power um, is uh, showed to, to a judge and to the notary, but to work well, it needs to have two other documents. The first one is the mandate, which is a, a type of a pact which sets out the, the terms of reference and saying, this is what I want, this is my will. And then, for the system to, to work well, you need a good will. And then if you have the, the mandate, the, the powers by proxy and the will, then things uh, work well. I had a case like this. It was very satisfying, very satisfactory. Um, my client's name was Doña Blanca, Madame Blanca, and she had her three documents. But I insist, you need the three, the three documents: the mandate, the, the powers by proxy, and the will. Now, the pandemic has been a low blow for our elderly. There are some videos that say we owe you everything and we have been very bad to you. But I want to remind you there is still time. You can still be good to the elderly. Now, geriatric um, or retirement homes, um, people are sent there when really there's no hope. Once you go in there, it is very difficult to go back to your home because if you you end up in um, in a retirement home is because you could not longer you can no longer live in your home. So, really, the solution is to look quality and warmth, and that is given by the person that holds your hand. Sometimes the only charity or the only warmth that I've seen in retirement homes is the marble at the entrance. We've said that we need to work on autonomy and self-sufficiency once you get there. That's what you need and not being treated like uh, you're in the barracks at the military. You have to f promote activity and, and games and not a sedentary um, lifestyle and to integrate, to, to become part of your environment. I think at this point we have no legislation and the one that we have is not always um, complied with and faced with the bad practices of our legislation is that we need the ombudsman of the er elderly in the format of the public prosecutor's office. And it has to be done with knowledge and respect of these small options of happiness. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fernando. I was listening to you, paying close attention, and uh, this is very important. The um, ombudsman of the elderly is it's a very important role. One of the phrases he said is to have the right to the opportunity of happiness. And this it's very easy to say, but then in practice, it's not that easy for our elderly. And in fact, it is the segment, the population segment, that at the world level has been more affected by the pandemic and by COVID-19. In this room, in the auditorium of Centro Centro, during these three days, we have expressed how important technology is so that it can be applied 
to people or, or by people because I was saying that this is where innovation comes from and the ultimate end of technological innovation. So we need to preach in this sense and we need to keep innovating to increase quality of life for our elderly more than more than for anyone which you know we would like them to be with us for as long as possible. Let's uh, finish with this three morning, with this third session, and it's called Inclusion, Diversity and Inclusion in the Company. The young and the senior. Imagine, we retire earlier and earlier, and there is no recycling of senior talent. There is a lack of social contracts and of value propositions from companies for consuming that senior talent, that senior knowledge. I am sure they will talk about that. In addition to talking about supply chain and inclusion opportunities, empowerment of indigenous women and young people, senior talent management, how to extend productive lives. And to talk about that, I would like to invite our next speakers to the stage. Please come up on the left side. And I would like to welcome Juan José Leal, Juan José Leal of the Organization of Iberoamerican States, Education Specialist. And we have Mr. Antonio Retamero Mates, President of the and the Lucian Foundation of Technology, Fundatec, our moderator, is Mr. Javier Dorado, Deputy Director of the Gregorio Pesas Barba Human Rights Institute of the Carlos III University. Then we have Gabriel Muyuri, Technical Secretary of the Fund for Development of Indigenous People of Latin America and the Caribbean, FILAC. Gabriel, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Good afternoon. Good day to you. Good afternoon from Spain. In a few minutes, I would like to let you know that we will be joined online by Maria Jose Alzari, coordinator of the area of transparency and social licensing of CEADS. Let's give them a round of applause. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you who are going to participate in this roundtable, Juan José, Antonio and Gabriel, who is joining us via streaming. Apparently, Maria José hasn't been able to connect yet. And um, I, I want to welcome all of you who are here with us in person and on streaming. I would like to set a few ground rules, if it's okay with you. So first of all, I will give you the floor, because it's good to know what you all do. So I will present you, I will introduce you first. We thought about having an initial round of maybe 10 or 15 minutes each following the order in which you introduce yourselves. And right after that, we'll have a, a, a debate where we can have, a, I don't know, a, a discussion or a, a Q&A session so that um, if the audience wants to ask a question, that would be the time to do that, if, you, if that's OK with you. First of all, I would like to introduce Mr. Juan Jose Leal. He is member, he's an education specialist and a member of the education team of the OIE. He is a graduate of uh, anthropology and has several PhDs, one of them from the, un the University Carlos III in Madrid, but also in RSC and in strategic organization. He's worked in different countries, institutions, and organizations, amongst them the European Union, the United Nations, and the, and the Spanish Cooperation Agency. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and for the presentation. I want to thank the organizers of Madrid Platform and thank you for all of you who are making it possible. I um, was looking at uh, the title of uh, the inaugural presentation of this roundtable, Diversity and Inclusion in the Company. 
young persons and, and seniors. So I think the best thing to do is to tell you what the OIE is and what I work on. All of these um, themes are closely related with education. And I want to center it on the digital gap and all its implications. The OIE is the Organization of Ibero-American States for Education, Science and Culture, and it has 23 members. We have offices in 18 of them, and the, secretariat, the, se the General Secretariat is based in Madrid. Before the pandemic, we were already talking about the importance on reducing the digital gap and all the implications this might have in different sectors. I often hear our secretary, we do a lot of accompaniment of public policy, and he says we need to do it based on data, using facts to inform that accompaniment. So one of the things we've been doing in this sense is uh, a research along with the ECLAC, and it's called, well, this was published last year, and I brought it, but of course you can look it up online. The title is Education, Youth and Work, Skills and Capacities in a Changing Context. So what we wanted to do was to see how young people were responding in this social, or in this, in this digital society, and we wanted to see if... Um, the skills they had when they finished their education actually favored their access to the labor market. We also wanted to study a relationship between um, the curricula that they studied and um, labor or, or job offers. So some of the, the findings were the following. There is uncertainty and young people have to keep training continuously so that they can immediately access job, jobs. Then secondly, the, the skills that they are learning in several levels of education is being very unequal. And this is damaging the more invisible and vulnerable groups with some gender considerations and indigenous peoples. Then there are new uh, skills such as uh, conflict management, social, emotional skills. And these are skills that are in high demand. The last finding of this study has to do with automation of many jobs because this is um, very negative particularly for the unskilled for unskilled laborers uh, unskilled workers when you go to a fast food restaurant you've seen that sometimes you just you can sell yourselves, you order yourselves, and you, it's self-service, and the same happens with ATM. So ma many uh, jobs have been lost. Based on this, we are thinking of a new strategy in digital skills and li digital literacy. Since we cannot be everywhere and reach all places, we need to be very clear on where our actions are going to be centered. It's not the same to reach a, a far, a remote rural area or a capital because the needs they have are different. It's uh, also very important to look for forums where the public school and the and private sector can meet for obvious reasons. Then we also want to produce contents, tools, and methodologies for um, hybrid education, digital, digital education as well. Um, since the pandemic, we've been mixing being in person and online, like in today's event. I don't know if a couple of years ago we would have done this or we would have been able. This uh, strategy includes courses and providing materials with equipment 
and access to, to connectivity, because that can make the difference between finishing their, their diplomas or not for students and then having access to a job. For us, it's also very important to systematize the experience and assess lessons learned, see if uh, we can replicate the experience in other countries and other contexts. As you can see from all these elements I'm listing, goes far beyond, well, I'm going to purchase some equipment. No, it's not only infrastructure, there has to be a logic and, and an accompaniment. Our main partners are the ministries of education of those 23 countries, but we also have um, executing or implementation partners. One of them is the Inter Inter Inter-American Development Bank, IDB. We're going to start a project called Education for the 21st Century in Latin America and the Caribbean, how to compete and innovate in the digital era. The idea of this program is to start in Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And it has two components. The first one is an interministerial dialogue to learn how the demands are, what are the needs, to see how many uh, companies we can count on for our work. And the second one is to drive this work of uh, digital education. We have to train our teachers if, because if they do not know what the digital skills are, how can they teach, it, teach them to their students? We also have to identify and adapt digital contents according to the demands and needs of each country. Students need to be trained, not only teachers, and then uh, the certification and accreditation of, uh, of or for the students once they finish their, their studies is important. We have the support of the cooperation, the Spanish Cooperation Agency. We had already started some projects with them, with uh, teachers and directors in places like Ecuador, Dominican Republic, and now in 2020, we have, or we're launching uh, projects in Panama. We're training them in digital skills and public administration. There are other projects of uh, institutional strengthening governance and skills for the whole educational community. In 2021, we, the, the ICD is providing funds to close the digital gap in Central America. This includes infrastructure, equipment, training, connectivity, repositories of resources. In the second semester, we hope to launch another strategy of digital skills in Costa Rica and, Repub and Dominican Republic. Another thing that is very related with the initial um, speech is that we signed a convention with the Ibero-American Organization of Social Security because I want you to know that we pay attention to our elderly. The idea is that our elderly becomes familiar with digital tools as well, and they can do it in a friendly and accessible way. And we're convinced that if we reach our elderly and they reach technological tools, their health, both from an emotional and physical perspective, will improve, as well as other factors. And this is a bit the logic of what we're doing now with regard to the subject of this roundtable, as we see that our actions do have an impact, a direct impact on education with the access of these youths to employment. And in the case of the elderly, we also have a, lit a life literacy program developed by the o um, OIE and also on digital literacy. And to close my intervention, of course, what is being proven and what I wanted to share here with you on the roundtable is a multiplying effect of digital literacy. Whatever we invest on this area will have an impact 
uh, an, an impact on health and on, on the economy and on every on every other aspect well thank you very much and now i'd like to give the floor to antonio retamero he's the founder of fundatec he's been an entrepreneur all his life in particular in technology and as of uh, in 2002 or no 2000 he decided to create this uh, foundation that works on implementing and supporting projects that bear into consideration the SDGs. And uh, since 2015, he's a member of uh, the UN Global Compact, and so is uh, his foundation. So please, Mr. Antonio, you have the floor. Well, thank you all, all of those who are here in the room and those who are following us online. My name is Antonio Retamero. I'm the president of Fundatec. Fundatec is a foundation, a private foundation. It's a non -for, it's a non for profit, of course, and is considered of social interest. We started in 2000, and we've been developing projects to benefit several groups with a set of tools, meaning technology, culture, and education. In the year 2016, we were fortunate enough to sign uh, or to adhere to the UN World Compact as members, and this meant an important shift to our foundation because we, of course, we wanted to grow as a foundation, but with the support provided by the World Compact, we found the necessary guide to make our projects that help society more object objective and more aligned with other NGOs, foundations, and companies that um, also gravitate towards the the UN Global Com Compact and the SDGs. And in that vein, I would like to talk about two specific SDGs that are very, very important and which affect the group that we uh, are talking about, the elderly, that is SDG number eight, aimed at sustainable economic growth and decent work. This is very, very important. And SDG number 10 that talks about eradication of inequality. So we cannot have people or groups. And lastly, we talk about a, a very important one that is women as a group or people with diverse capacities or abilities. But I think that the Mm, the problem in our society, there are, there are societies that care for the elderly, but that is no longer the case in our country. The situation with the COVID-19 pandemic has made us see that both dignity and also the opportunities for socializing or even for working for those who are still in active age or want to do so due to their nature can actually access uh, jobs. And we focus on the elderly because traditionally we've worked with youths and with children. But in the world of seniors, we started last year invited by the Kaisha Foundation with a beautiful project where we saw firsthand the problems that these uh, people face, and also we saw their suffering. We saw the suffering of particularly those who live in um, elderly homes without the possibility of having their loved one, loved ones come see them. And so, in our in, in our in the in that project, our role was providing some initial training on uh, digital skills. These people received a tablet, which was a fantastic gift, but they didn't know how to use it. And with that project, we had the opportunity to interact on the ground 
how they suffered from this digital gap. So after that, we started raising a number of questions because even if we hadn't uh, worked in the sector of elderly citizens, we had to do something. We wondered whether it was uh, interesting or intelligent or smart enough to lose the talent that these people have, people who go from 60, 65 years old towards the end uh, of their lives. Could our society afford to bypass or to ignore everything that these people had achieved throughout their lives. They had helped uh, in economic growth. They had helped raise families. And the last question that we asked ourselves was, was if it was decent to exclude these persons based on the grounds of gender uh, beliefs or age. And it felt cruel to see that some people were excluded due to their age. And so the first thing we did was carry out a thorough study to detect or identify the situation. And for us, who come from the technological world, we, we saw a great paradox. It is taken for granted that an elderly person or even a 40-year-old person will have difficulties to access the digital world. And there's nothing, it's nothing like that. The pandemic has shown us that in a very short period of time, in weeks, they've been able to use technology for the purpose of social license through video calls. They've used bank services because there was no longer the, op the option to go to, to the bank office, among other among other possibilities. Thus, it was clear that we needed to break that cliche that senior citizens could not be uh, full citizens within the digital society. And based on that study that we conducted, we developed a project where the goal was to design an itinerary that included, among others, the factors which had led to this uh, digital gap in the elderly. And because our practice is to start with a pilot project with specific uh, objectives, we decided to work with a group that is having a very hard time right now. And worldwide, that's the case as well. But right now, and in this country, it, these are people that are suffering a lot. These are people who are being forced into unemployment by corporations, companies, banking institutions, etc. Et these are news that are on, on, the, on the TVs, on the media every day. People who are used to working in a company find themselves in a, find themselves in the, in the situation, in a situation where they leave the labor market and see their CVs ruled out just because of their age. So we had to work on giving them the tools, because even when in most cases these people have developed and conducted their work in great organizations with corporate tools that are also digital, but which are intended for internal use within those corporations, and, and and this without giving them the necessary tools to work or to be useful to society with the provision of a more broad approach. And so our team decided to work to create awareness about the fact that, yes, technological tools can be used in order to become uh, digital citizens, and then all the, the process that entailed mentoring, tutoring, and also access to the labor market, knowing that, uh, that, that employment is a rare 
treasure and that the work um, as freelancers or social work could be a good option, a natural and organic option for these citizens to have a work uh, or a career development that is necessary for them, especially for people aged 45 and 60, people who are leaving the employment sector, they need to work because they have to pay mortgages, they need to pay for their children's education, etc. And I don't want to go any longer so that we can give some time uh, to the Q&A. And now I will give the floor to Gabriel Mumui. He's the technical secretary of the Fund for the Development of the indigenous peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. He has a degree in philosophy and he has studied anthropology, a master's in government and public policies. He worked as a professor of philosophy for over 10 years and has a long standing experience in the defense of indigenous peoples in his country. He was also vice president of the National Organization for Indigenous Peoples in Colombia. He has been advisor of the presidential program for the indigenous peoples in Colombia and senator throughout two administrations in representation of the indigenous movement. He also collaborates as independent consultant with other international organizations such as the UN where he works as an advisor on rights for the indigenous peoples, people from the Roma community and Afro descendants. So, Mr. Mumui, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to all my dear friends from Iberoamerica, America, from Latin America, in the Caribbean, and good afternoon to all the people who are taking part in this very important event in Madrid. I am truly thankful for the invitation to this panel. I would like to greet warmly my dear friend Javier, and of course, all the organizers and members of the panel. And Maria Jose, of course, who, has, who is not here, here yet. I would like to say that, is, that it is very important to talk about diversity and inclusion. And I would like to mention, as Javier introduced, I am the Technical Secretary of FILAC, the Fund for the Development for the Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean, which was created in 1992 by the chiefs of state, heads of state and government in their second summit. And this is a uh, an organization that is based on equality uh, principles and includes countries such as Portugal, Spain, and Belgium, in addition to Latin American countries, and representatives from the indigenous peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is an international organization with, a unique fe with unique features whose mission is facilitating and supporting, boosting the development of indigenous peoples. That is the essential mission of FILAC. But I don't want to focus on what my organization is. I would like to very quickly delve into the points that are, have been raised in this panel and this topic. First of all, I would like to say that in the last 60 years, the world and the peoples have advanced and democracies, states have substantially advanced in the recognition of the rights of cultural diversity of peoples in general, and in particular, in particular of indigenous peoples. And this advances, this progress made by the fight of the peoples, as you all know, are very well developed and drafted in international treaties or in international regulations, as well in national regulations, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. 
importantes. Hay declaraciones, hay recomendaciones. There are statements, there are recommendations from specialized bodies at an international and local level on this issue. That is vital. These issues have also been dealt with in research projects, among other instruments. And it is important to mention here that Spain has played a key role in this, as well as many other countries. Churches, NGO, um, institutions from the UN system, from the inter-American inter -American system, many people and institutions have mobilized. And we have the ILO Convention on Indigenous Peoples and Tribal Peoples adopted by the ILO. This is uh, an international law instrument that recognizes diversity and respect to the indigenous peoples of the world. But after 25 years of long debates and discussions, we have the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of the UN adopted by the General Assembly in 2007. This is another non-binding legal instrument on like, uh, just like the, the ILO Convention, but it is a political instrument because of the way in which it was adopted and negotiated. And politically and ethically, it should be observed by the member states and includes countries from Europe, from Latin America, and other countries. Now, going to the regional sphere, we have other instruments that entailed over 15 years of negotiation and was finally approved in 2016, and that is the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of the Americas. These are three instruments that an, an evolution of previous legal instruments, the Pact on Economic and Social Rights, for example, there are over 60 international instruments that, in a comprehensive and specific way, recognize the value of this diversity. And of course, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there, have been, there has been great progress in the inclusion of diversity and cultural diversity of peoples, of indigenous peoples in their constitutions. So we cannot complain with regard to formal recognition. There's been great effort from the political, cultural, and social and academic sphere in this regard. But there is another point, and that is what happens with the application and the effective guarantee of these rights. We face many challenges, unfortunately, on the one hand, Many of them do not take into consideration the SDGs that were mentioned by Mr. Antonio. So we have a problem, and the problem is that society, in, in general, and the educational systems have not adopted a practical approach uh, and have not trained public workers to embrace this um, target. And this creates understanding issues. This also creates conflicts. The other problem that we've seen is the lack of an institutional accommodation or adjustment, both in the public and private sector. Institutions remain monocultural, and this hinders access to an intercultural interaction. And so I would like to invite those who are here to internally review how they are working in their private and public institutions. 
efectivo de estos derechos de For, avances, in terms of the effective applications of this advances that I've mentioned, eh, that, is, uh, that is a structural difícil, issue that is very complicated, pueblos, and before that, indigenous, indigenous peoples demand proper um, attention and the lack of answer, the lack of response is complicating relations on the base of respect and we are even seeing some violation of human rights as the situation that we are now seeing in Colombia that we've been it's been developing for the last 15 days a third challenge is that we need an effective application of this progress and the inclusion, the effective inclusion of the poverty perspective. This is something that has been ignored by companies and by governments who still have this paternalist approach towards indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples, in particular in Colombia, one of the 115 indigenous peoples in Colombia and one out of the more than 600 indigenous peoples that exist in Latin America. We are not poor people who need help. We have ancient knowledge in many areas. We have a vision on development. We have a vision about life. We have a vision about the environment. And there is great potential. We are not people who need charity. There is potential. What we need to do is channel the participation, the effective participation in the decision-making processes and in the design of public policies, programs and projects, and not treat us as people who are in need of help and charity. Because this affects even the ancient dignity of indigenous peoples. Javier, Gabriel, I apologize. I need to uh, interrupt for a second. I apologize because there have been some connection issues throughout Mr. Gabriel's intervention. I don't know, Gabriel, if you could improve a little bit the quality of the signal because there are moments where we cannot understand you clearly. Thank you very much in any case. And I also wanted to mention Javier, that we already have with us, in case you want to give her the floor, Maria Jose Alzari, who is the coordinator of the Transparency and Social License Unit at the Business Council of Sustainable Development in Argentina. Maria Jose, I don't know if you're there, and maybe we can greet her. There she is, Maria Jose. How are you? Hello, good morning, everyone, or good morning in Buenos Aires, at least. Great to see you, and Javier, I give you the floor back again. And just to a quick reminder, we will finish just before 2. Gabriel, yes, you can carry on. It's true that there were some connection issues, but let's see if things pick up now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, the signal is kind of uh, messy, but if there's any problem, uh, please let me know, otherwise I'll be talking to myself. So I was saying that there are some difficulties that need to be tackled with regard to the treatment and the persistence of assistentialist and paternalist public policies for the indigenous peoples. A third problem that is complicating the, up, the effective application on a day-to-day -day basis on these formal advances is the lack of guarantees for full participation and effective participation in the development processes of the countries and of the peoples. There is a lack of participation with a differential and intercultural perspective. So, it is preferred to provide assistentialism instead of guaranteeing participation. Today, I would like to say that in Latin America, we have people, we have a great pool of youths 
that are very well trained. Many of them have studied in public universities in their countries. Some of them even hold PhDs from European or American universities and institutions. So there's a pool of talent, but we don't guarantee effective participation. And that is effective, affecting, of course, their inclusion and their participation in a comprehensive way. And to finalize, what do we do as FILAC, as an international organization, as an egalitarian institution? Very quickly, I would like to tell you that to, to us, it is fundamental to boost cultural development. So our own development, this is a right that is enshrined in Article 7 of uh, the Agreement 169, and as well as other legal instruments. This point is key. What does it mean to facilitate our own development? It means working for the inclusion of public policies under an intercultural uh, approach. Secondly, it is very important to guarantee the right to our territory because our peoples have ancient territories in rural areas where there is a great wealth in terms of biodiversity. And so it is key to guarantee the right to territory. Thirdly, it is also fundamental to guarantee political participation in its broadest sense. I say this as a member of the indigenous people. I don't want any more paternalism or paternalistic assistance. I need guarantee in the previous consultations and informal consultations, it is concerning that in some countries in the region, we still see processes that are impoverishing us even more. They are excluding indigenous peoples and they are deviating from the way in which it should be um, implemented. So in that way, we are working at FILAC so that through dialogue and intercultural agreement, we obtain or we reach full participation in public policies. We ensure develop, the development of indigenous peoples in their territories, and we guarantee full participation, what I was saying, and what my, pre my, pre my the previous speakers we're saying participation for education. And in that regard, it is also very important to strengthen the economic rights of indigenous peoples. If that is not guaranteed, it will be very difficult to make progress in the inclusion from the inclusion of peoples. And I would like to conclude by saying that at FILAC, we're working so that in the years 2022 and 2032, indigenous languages that are the result of ancient thoughts, the ancient reflections and traditions, and we have received endorsement of the Ibero-American Association of Languages in the last summit of heads of states and government in April last uh, in April this year in Andorra. And we now have ahead of us the great endeavor to implement to implement all the actions to strengthen and to revitalize languages because that revitalizes culture, it revitalizes the environment because languages bring an organic development. Of course, we are still working on everything that has to do with dialogue and 
And we want to boost indigenous universities. And in that regard, the University, the Carlos III University has participated. We would like to strengthen this link with other European universities that are also part of the network. Because they have many programs on intercultural indigenous um, theory and development, and I think that at FILAC we are talking to the governments, but also the indigenous peoples, because as I said, this is an institution that works and, and favors equality. So I thank you for this opportunity, and what I would like to tell you that Today, the 21st century, and after the great impact, the great blow of the pandemic, and in a post-pandemic perspective, we need to tell humankind that intercultural diversity requires cooperation. And I invite all the members of the panel and all of you to work together. Let's not see indigenous peoples as people who need assistance. We're in the 21st century. The SDGs demand changes in attitude for the understanding amongst countries. So that inclusion means work and not assistentialism or paternalism. So thank you. Oh. Thank you, Gabriel. We will now give the floor to the last speaker of this round table. Who is Maria José Alzari, coordinator of the area of transparency and social license of the CADS in Argentina. She is an attorney. She's been working with the business sector in several aspects for several years. She works in sustainability and she's participated in many international and local processes in this area. Not only has she advised and trained several companies and organizations, but in addition, she has contributed as an advisor for the ILO and other organizations. Maria Jose, welcome. And the floor is yours for 10 to 15 minutes, so we can have a few minutes at the end to either have a little bit of a debate and discussion or to have a Q&A session with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. And thank you for the Madrid Platform Organization for inviting me and allowing me to share some of uh, some of, some of my insights. I also wanted to thank the regional uh, sector of uh, the private of private businesses because they contributed to my participation here today with you. The main the central topic here is inclusion and diversity and how the, um, the private sector can undertake this huge challenge of uh, inclus inclusiveness and diversity. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we talk about groups with certain vulnerability or with certain um, disabilities, and this might seem to make it necessary to change our wavelength, because it can look like a huge challenge. But more than a challenge, I think it is a great opportunity, and more than anything, it is an indispensable necessity. We can think of um, employers' associations or, or businesses, right? But how can we consider them without thinking of inclusion? And when I mention having a, a large perspective, I, I am referring to the inside of the business and to the way it relates to the environment and to its stakeholders. We have a series of instruments and initiatives that clearly state what the way, what way we should follow. We really can't use the excuse of, oh, we don't know how. We don't know how to do this, because the how to do it has already been identified. 
On Monday, we spoke a lot about the SDGs. Then the SDGs are really a platform of sorts that uh, brings together all aspects of uh, sustainability access around respect. There is a, a crucial SDG, which for me is, is key, and is, this is SDG 16 that talks about strengthening public institutions. I think this is a, a big umbrella, this SDG, but I think there are other initiatives. One of them is a little bit old, but it's always present, and it's the Global Compact, the ISO 26000. It's another good agenda, so to speak, that allows uh, companies how to identify and manage, and then the guiding principles for uh, businesses and human rights of the United Nations. There is certainly a, a gender dimension. We cannot leave gender out given recent developments, but also the ILO has recognized that women are under a particularly vulnerable situation within the framework of the pandemic of COVID-19 and the world of work. All these situations have placed women in a position where they have to face new developments in terms of their own development and inclusion. But women are not the only one. There are other groups. For example, the LGBT. The elderly, young people. These are all groups with different needs and characteristics. In this sense, there is a very interesting instrument that was defined night, uh, last year as a global world, which is Convention 190 on harassment and violence in the world of work. This convention, C190, defines harassment in the, at the workplace. And why am I mentioning it here when we're talking about inclusion? Well, C190 focuses on preventing a situation. It is meant to prevent harassment and violence. But it has a particular approach. It has a preventative approach. It anticipates. And why does it anticipate? Because it is a mandatory and binding instrument for states. And thanks to this, other instruments can then be set out on a voluntary basis, like the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Just like the Guiding Principles and, and the Due Diligence Guidelines of the ODCE, this instrument requires the following. It says, we should or policies should be defined. The organization needs to define policies and has to commit with respect, with respecting others, with non-discrimination. And then procedures need to be set out. Those procedures are meant to identify where or how, as a company, could there be the possibility of creating a situation of vulnerability for others. This is done through risk assessments or with risk assessments with a human rights approach or due diligence. 
This analysis, whatever its name, will allow us to identify situations and prevent a situation of non-respect or of discrimination or harassment of violence. And if prevention doesn't quite work, if this action happens, um, the consequences will be less and uh, the response capacity will be faster. This will reduce violations and, of course, the company needs to be in a position really to respond or to remedy a situation in which a, a, a violation might occur or a breach might occur. This really means inclusion and openness from an organization. And it reflects or it allows the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to be applied to any group and to any situation. Gabriel earlier was um, talking about how the business world relates to indigenous people. I think this approach allows really to create genuine relations. The tools are available. They exist. The way to do it exists. No, this needs to be implemented from a rights or taking rights as a, as a basis. Now an organization can appropriately manage these situations. But not only that, they can also at the same time think of their own business continuity of carrying out their own operations while managing a respect because if they don't think of that then they are they're they're wrong because now society is demanding this there is something very very related to what gabriel was saying which is dialogue and dialogue means listening to others. If you don't listen to others, you're just doing a monologue. So you should be able to listen to others and to provide a response, even if the response is, I cannot solve this situation today. There is plenty of evidence that says that organizations that undertake dialogue are more able to manage cooperation with the final aim to contribute to fairer societies that are more inclusive and more dynamic societies in which we can all make our own contribution to realize the SDGs. I will finish with that to leave enough time for a, a discussion between the, amongst the panelists. Thank you, Maria Jose, for your participation. I don't know if there is any question from the audience. I, I, I really can think of many. Perhaps I would like to ask a few that are in direct relation with uh, the, the title of this roundtable. So, Jose and Antonio, let's go back to senior talent and how to manage it. You, that's what you work on in your organizations. Do you believe there is a public policy problem because they are very much devoted to entrepreneur, entrepreneurship? Um, maybe we are giving a payback to companies that hire employees, but could we maybe do more to attract senior talent in this sense? Without a doubt, without a doubt. 
We think it is crucial that aid come along with a vision and show people that are going to end up unemployed that there are other possibilities. Imagine a person that worked his or her entire life for a company. We're normally talking about large corporations, and they have a very biased vision of what the world of work is nowadays because there is a lack of uh, being employed by an employer. So there is, we have to do whatever we can because anything we do will be positive. There, there has to be a lot of uh, information to, to educate on how much the world of work has changed. We also need to urge decision makers to adequate law, the, the laws, the legislation in this country to stop our country from being one of the countries in the world that have less freelance workers because the laws really don't promote it. We need to make a common effort where everyone can make a contribution. Juanjo, yes, yes, I was thinking about the different contexts that we have in Latin America and Iberia America. I certainly agree that we have to do whatever we can to invest and uh, promote senior talent. We have some examples here in Spain, which is closer to us. Um, layoffs are, are being facilitated so that we can give more more room to, to young people that are higher trained and who will earn a lower salary. That's what happens here. But then what happens in other countries? So I completely agree that we need to do something. We need to think about what's happening in other countries. We know what's happening in Spain. It's also happening in uh, Iberoamerica. We don't know if it's because the people reach a certain age and the skills they have are no longer needed or what, what is happening. How can Fundatec help to implement SDGs in organizations? This is a good question. We are trying to obtain help and collaboration of employers' associations, of business associations. In fact, we have already signed an agreement with Acotec. This is a, an association that works in technology. They have a lot of a future. We're also with Conectic, which is a national confederation of um, business working on technology and digital transformation. They are going to help us with this project. And we would welcome any type of help. I have to say something else. We have a macro project called Digital Elderly, and this macro project is new employment for the digital economy. We will launch it later on. We are working on it right now, and we are inviting all the organizations that wish to do so to collaborate with us. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is, is interested. We're also working with um, a Latin American country. There is an organization called LIDE in, in South America called and Business Leaders in South America. They are very active in the Mercosur area. We think that once the project is developed in Spain, we are going to try to send it to Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay as well. Now I have a question for Gabriel. Gabriel, you were talking about practical problems. You know that uh, legally indigenous rights are perfectly recognized. In the case of Colombia and other countries, they have also been covered by the Constitution. But you keep talking about the practical problems that this implies for multiculturalism. I wanted to ask you, what do you think that 
that indigenous communities can do for the Western world in terms of respect of the environment and respect and care of the elderly, which I think these are two, um, two aspects in which we should learn from indigenous visions. I don't know if you can tell us something about that. Thank you very much, Javier, for your question. Amigos panelistas, María José, y todos los que están siguiendo este este diálogo, los pueblos indígenas. Thank you to all of you who are following this dialogue. Apparently, the uh, image froze, and there is no audio feed coming. Let's wait for Gabriel to come back. Maria Jose, you were talking about inclusion and different groups, vulnerable groups, and how companies have to manage that. You were talking about harassment and violence and diversity and, e and equality policies within organizations. I would like to mention the importance of the uh, supply chain and inclusion. Could you tell us about that? What could you tell us about that? I think inclusion in a supply chain is key, particularly in this context of uh, global companies that uh, carry out activities in developing countries that have certain institutional weaknesses. The supply chain brings about great challenges that uh, deepen the difficulties and perhaps the opportunities in inclusion and diversity. Large chains have structural weaknesses that are very significant and they require additional support. So these, um, initi these international initiatives that I named also lead to identifying breaches and possible impacts in our rights and how to manage that. This is present in the guiding principles, but not only there, it's also part of other initiatives like the norms of World Bank, uh, financial cooperation. Because those institutions can accompany the strengthening and development of supply chains. And it's not assuming responsibilities that don't belong to them, but perhaps companies should have the responsibility of accompanying them or guiding them. And they should be able to say, look, you need to strengthen this aspect. I can help you reach certain regulatory standards. How? Well, maybe we could establish hiring system or differentiated payment systems for uh, suppliers that have greater vulnerabilities or who have to face more complexities. I could train you, I could accompany you in your development. Because we often see that these demands from large companies of hiring all of those who are perfect are logic, they have their logic to a certain extent, but if those who have greater capacity do not help or do not accompany those who have more weaknesses or have more difficulties to reach certain standards, then they will be left out of the market and we generate exclusion. So, I think that big organizations should be responsible for accompanying the smaller players in supply chains, particularly in sectors where they already have the capacity to recognize that there are certain structural weaknesses. I think this is key to achieve and realize SDGs, particularly within the framework of SDG 12 and 8, very important for businesses. 
because they will strengthen dissent work, which will in turn lead to achieving SDGs 1 and 2. I think the MC had a, a few questions, but we still need to hear Gabriel's uh, answer. I think we have we have time. So let, let me let me see. So Gabriel, could you please be very brief in your response so we can he hear or take two more questions? Can you hear me? More or less, the interpreter confirms that uh, his audio cuts out, but uh, the interpreter will do her best. There was a study done by um, some countries in Europe that says that indigenous peoples control or are owners of 5% of the territory in the planet that contains strategic resources such as uh, water, uh, fuels, oxygen, etc. In the case of Latin America, we carried out a very important study with the FAO about forests and indigenous territories in Latin America. And mo more than 25% of the area studied is indigenous territory. So what do we have to do? We have to change our vision. We need partners. I invite Juan Jose and Antonio and Maria Jose to be partners. Partner up with us. Let's work together with indigenous peoples. That is inclusion. And we need to boost it. Because if we are talking about business, the, the, the resources are in the Amazonic basin. Uh, but not only that, that's where oxygen comes from. And the planet need, needs oxygen. We shouldn't be treated with discrimination or, or saying, oh, poor indigenous people, they need aid. No. I invite you to partner up with us and to join our efforts. We have a platform in our mandate that allows us to collaborate in, uh, with, with governments and with businesses and with indigenous people. Finally, I want to invite all of you to work with us because the world needs it. Otherwise, we will never fulfill the SDGs. And I remind you what the Secretary General of the United Nations says, no one can be left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful round table moderated by Javier. It is not easy to moderate a panel, but in this hybrid format, I can assure you that it's even harder. Thank you very much. Um, I would invite you now to leave the stage on the left side. Thank you to Gabriel and to Maria Jose. I think they are still listening to me, even though we can't see them anymore. And uh, you heard it very clearly. Gabriel extended his hand to us, who he called to establish links, and really links, building links, building bridges is what brought us together to Madrid Platform. The idea is to connect businesses from different countries. 51 countries connected on Monday, 44 yesterday, and I am dying of curiosity to see the final figure when we finish today's program. Now, all of you who are watching us through streaming, let's go and have lunch and we will be back in two hours. Then we will have the final session at 4 at 4 p.m. Spanish time, so in two hours we will meet again in this auditorium to welcome the Forum of International Digital Transformation. Thank you very much. See you in two hours.